One of the things about the coronavirus that's been interesting to me is you see scripture that's been placed uh, online or, um, you know, you see posters, you hear people on the radio quote verses and things. And one of the most uh, famous verses has been uh, Philippians 4, uh, 6. So do not, uh, Jeff, could you turn us down just a little bit? I'm hearing an echo. Is that, is that better? Can you hear me now? Good, good, okay. Um, thank you. Uh, but to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, uh, to present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That, that has been mentioned over and over again. And, and I see that on posters and hear people quote that verse. But I'm not so sure we always understand the context and what this was presented. And when the Apostle Paul said this, it's a wonderful verse and one to apply to your life. And I memorized it long ago and I use it often. Uh, but I want to make sure that we understand the context. And when I was looking at this, it, it was more than what I could cover in one week. So we're going to cover this verse for at least this week and next week and maybe for three weeks. And I think since it's been one of everybody's favorites, or at least what it looks like to me, I, I don't think you'll mind that. And it'll help us understand it a little bit more. But let me read from Philippians chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 4. It said, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think of these things. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Now I've heard some common advice that I hear people say once in a while, and I've actually told people this myself. And I think in some examples it's really good advice. Maybe you've heard it, where someone has said, just be yourself. Have you ever been told that? Oh, just be yourself. Now, maybe you had an interview or something you had to do, or, or maybe it was a first date or something like that, and, and you were nervous and worried and you were thinking you weren't good enough, and, and so someone said, oh, just be yourself. You'll be at your best when you're, you're just being yourself. And I think that's really true. It's common advice. And, and God has created each one of us to be unique. He's created each one of us with a, a different job. I've got a different job than you've got. A different purpose, a part of his plan than you've got. He's created all of us different. And so I think that's some good advice to just be yourself when you use it in the right context. But I think when we're following Christ, Sometimes this advice is not good to just be yourselves. Because God is calling us to be more than just ourselves and calling us to be better than just ourselves. Actually, we're called to be like Christ. We're called to be like Christ. And so what we think and, and how we act is supposed to be like Christ. And so I want to show this to you in the background of this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. And, and so that you understand what Paul is talking about when you read these verses that are quoted so much today. And I want you to start out by understanding that Paul absolutely loved these people at this church. They were so precious to him. In chapter 1, verse 3, he says, I thank my God every time I think of you. Paul really loved these people and praised God for them. In verse 6 of chapter 1, he says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Paul trusted them and knew that God was working in them and knew that they were going to be okay with God, that God was going to accomplish what he wanted in their life. And in verse 7, he says, I have you in my heart. Paul dearly loved his church and loved these people. And you can't really understand this book unless you know that. So everything he tells them is because he loves them. He dearly loves them. 
And everything he says is based on this love. But Paul is calling them to a higher calling because he loves them. He's asking them to change and to be like Christ because he loves them. Paul wants them to follow a higher calling. He wants them to be united in Christ and be like Christ. In verse 27 of the first chapter, he says, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, contending as one man, in other words, united like one person, for the faith of the gospel. And that's their purpose. We have a purpose. Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. In other words, we're going to have obstacles. We're going to have opposition in our life when we follow Christ. It's going to happen. But we need to be united together as brothers and sisters in Christ and act and think and talk like one man one person because we're united under Christ and we act and we think and we talk like him and then in chapter 2 he says your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus we need to be like Christ we're to think like Christ we're to act like Christ he wants us to be like Jesus in verses 1 through 4 he, he even drills us on a little deeper in chapter 2, he says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, and surely we do, don't we? If you have any comfort from His love, and surely we have lots of comfort from Christ. If any fellowship of the Spirit, and surely His Spirit is important and precious in our life. If we have any tenderness and compassion from the Lord Jesus, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the Spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. And then, he tells us how Christ humbled himself. Christ humbled himself for you. In verse 5, your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. It goes on in verse 6. Who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. Think of how far Jesus went for you. He died for you. He lives for you. And this same God, this same Jesus, is working in you to make him like himself. In verse 13 in chapter 2, it says, It is God who works in you to will and act according to a good purpose. So God is working inside of all of us to make us better. To not just be ourselves anymore, but to be like Christ. But you have a choice. Will you help him make you more Christ-like? Will you help him do this? Or will you ignore his work in your life? Will you become an obstacle to his work in your life and his plans in the world? Becoming like Christ means you need to be humble. You need to die to yourself and live to Christ. You must not think so much of yourself, but think of others. And then in chapter 3, Paul goes for this even further and tells his own personal testimony. And he kind of gives a little bit of a list of his resume, these wonderful things that he's been through. But he says, I want you to know that I have no confidence in the flesh and all of his great skill and talents and wonderful things he's done. He says, I have no confidence in myself. Is what he's saying. He considers everything he did, uh, you know, all of his trophies and awards and things that he got are a loss and rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. Nothing compares to that. That's the best reward you could have. And he says his righteousness comes from Christ. And Paul wants to be found in him. And then he says this remarkable verse in, in chapter 3, verse 10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. In other words, he wants to have a new life in his Christ. But he wants to die to himself and live to Christ. And the fellowship of the sharing of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Paul wants to die as far as he knows, but live to Christ. And somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead, he wants Jesus Christ to bring him back to life again in a new way. He doesn't want to just be himself anymore. Paul wants to be like Christ more than anything in his life. And that means he has to die to himself, and it means he must be made alive to Jesus Christ. And then he goes on a little further, and it helps all of us if we're going to do this to remember our goal. To remember our goal. In Philippians 3, 
uh, verse 13, he says, But forgetting what lies behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the price, and listen to these words, that God has called you heavenward in Christ Jesus. God is calling us heavenward. He doesn't want us to live like worldly, earthly people. He's calling us heavenward. He wants us to be like him. He wants us to change. God is calling us heavenward to be like Christ. But then the passage that we read in chapter 4 kind of tells us how to do this. It tells us if you want to be like Christ, how do you do this? And at the first part, it tells us how to pray. It tells us how to pray. Uh, to rejoice always. You know, the prayer, we ought to bubble over with the joy that we have of having Christ in our life. Now, that doesn't mean every minute of the day we're like that. If we're sad, we share that with Christ as well. But we have a joy in us that can't be shaken. And he says it twice. He says, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't forget that God is with you. And he wants us to pray like God is right there listening. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Doesn't that make a difference if you understand the context of how he wants us to be like Jesus in the way that we pray? When we go to the Lord with prayer. Do you ever remember Jesus asking for one thing for himself? The only time he did was in the garden when he said, take this cup from me, but not what I want, but what you want. That's the only time I can remember him asking for something for himself. Yeah, all of his prayers were for others. All of his prayers were for others. Jesus teaches us how to pray. Not to be anxious, but to trust God. And we're going to look at this closer next week. What, the, what do these mean to pray, to petition, a supplication, and to do these prayers with thanksgiving, knowing that Jesus is good to us. We go to him with thanksgiving. We're not a beggar just pleading, but we know that he loves us and that we will receive peace from him. And then, isn't that what the world needs today? Peace. It needs peace from God. It wants a different kind of peace. It wants peace that is like, you know, I want to live the way I want and I want to be happy about it and I don't want you to bother me. That's the kind of peace people want. It's not the kind of peace that comes from God. But we rejoice. And he guards our hearts with his peace. And then he goes on a little further, how to be like Christ. And he tells us you need to think like Christ if you're going to be like Christ. And he says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, and, and think about these, whatever is true, in other words, to stop dealing in lies. To don't listen to lies, don't believe them, don't pass them around. Whatever is noble, to not get drugged down with things that are dishonorable. And irreparable to do not let things distract us and whatever is right not to dwell on things that are wrong whatever is pure in other words there's no compromise in our life we're not distracted or, or tainted by anything we know who Jesus is whatever is lovely in other words don't get caught up in the ugliness of the world around us whatever is admirable not what is despised in the world if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, to think of these things. To think about such things is to think like Christ. And then Paul goes one step further in verse 9. Not only do we need to pray like Christ and, and think like Christ, but we need to act like Christ. We need to live like Jesus. And he says in verse 9, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. In other words, Paul didn't waste his time to teach them and then they just live any way they wanted. He wanted them to put into practice what he had taught them, what they had learned from Jesus, what the Holy Spirit had worked in their life. He wants them to practice, to live that way. It matters what you do in your life. It matters what you do. Isn't that a wonderful passage in Scripture? And, and it's really perfect for today, isn't it, in today's world? And all the things that we have to face and all the things we have to do is an extremely encouraging verse. Except for one thing. I didn't tell you the whole story. I left out part of the context of why Paul said this verse. And so I want to share that with you. I want to make sure you understand 
why he wrote this passage, why, why this is so important. Because you see, in the church at Philippi, there was a disagreement between two ladies, two giants of the faith, that were fighting each other and disagreeing on each other. One was pulling one way, one was pulling the other way. And the church was divided and falling apart because of these two giants of the faith in the church. And they were doing these things. That's verse 2 and 3. I started verse 4. So let's go back and look at those. I plead with Eudia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Plead with them that they will agree in the Lord. And notice that Paul doesn't say that they just need to agree with, over, with each other and get over this or come to some kind of compromise. He's saying they need to agree in the Lord. In other words, they each need to forget about what they want and pay attention to what Jesus wants. And that's a big difference. That's a big difference. All the things you see in politics and in the world today, what everybody is saying is we need to just get along and agree. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, you need to follow me and agree with me. We need to agree in the Lord. And that's a big difference. That's a big difference. He is God. He is Lord. And we do whatever he says or asks. The other thing about this that's really interesting is he, he says, plead with them. In other words, he's writing to the other people in the church that's saying, you need to plead with these two ladies and let them know that they need to get along. And they need to settle this disagreement because they're pulling everybody apart. They're ruining the witness of Jesus Christ in this church. Plead with them that they agree in the Lord. And so he's asking the church to help them. And he calls them loyal yoke fellows. In other words, they're all together. You see, we're part of a body of Christ. We're all in this together, aren't we? There's, there's not one person that's really any more received any more grace than anybody else. If it wasn't for Jesus Christ, we would all have no hope at all. It's because of his grace that we follow him. And so we're part of the body of Christ, and Jesus is the head. Not me, not you, not anybody else in this church. Jesus Christ is the head. So there's no such thing as a disagreement that's private in the church. We're part of a body. If part of the body hurts, it all hurts. If part of the body trips and stumbles, it all stumbles. We're part of the body. They are doing body work by trying to plead with these women to help them. And notice that Paul loves them dearly and respects them dearly. He says, they contended at my side for the gospel of Christ. I've worked with these ladies. I know that Jesus is in their heart. I know that God has blessed them and blessed their ministry. And, and he says, remember our goals. You know, we need to remember that we're working for the gospel and not to get our way. There is a difference. We need to remember our goal and what we're working for. But these are fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Notice that. Notice that Paul never says, look, you know, they're going to go to hell because they're having this dis disagreement. He says their names are already in the book of life. They're going to be there in heaven with you. Did you catch that? We're fellow workers in heaven. Our names are in the book of life. So we need to treat people like that. People disagree all the time. People get mad and upset all the time, and, and sometimes they quit. Sometimes they run and move to another church. But when you go to heaven, you're not going to be able to do that. You're not going to be able to do that. Sometimes they leave a church, or they start a new church, or sometimes they avoid talking to certain people, or they won't go see somebody because they just there's too much friction. It's just too hard. You won't be able to do that in heaven. They're going to be there too. God is calling us to something better than that. He's calling us to humble ourselves like Christ. He's asking us to pray like Christ for each other. He's asking us to think like Christ. He's asking us to act like Christ. Now I say this, and, and I don't have any scripture reference to prove this, but I believe it. I believe that in heaven, the most irritating Christian that you know the person that annoys you the most is going to be your next door neighbor for eternity. I believe that. You're not going to be able to get away from that. God is not going to allow you to do that. It wouldn't be heaven if he did. It wouldn't be heaven if he did. And so you might as well try to fix the thing now. You might as well you know, become one in the spirit now. 
You might disagree, but you can come together in Christ. Paul wrote this beautiful passage because he wanted people in this church to get along. He wanted them to act like Jesus. He wanted them to think like Jesus. He wanted them to pray like Jesus. Now, I'm going to read this one more time, and I want you to remember the context. I want you to maybe think of someone that you have a disagreement with, someone that you uh, know is hurt. And they need your help. They need you to plead with them or as a young fellow in Christ to reach out to them. And I want you to reread this and rethink about what Paul is really saying here. Rejoice in the Lord always. We get down. We have disagreements. But they should never end their joy. I say it again. It's that important he repeats it. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. If you knew the Lord was near, would you do and say everything that you do and say? Do not be anxious about anything. Don't get upset. But in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, to be thankful for this other person, to be thankful to the Lord for them, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's how you get peace. And finally, brothers, whatever is true, but when you think of other people, do you see the good in them? Do you see the things that they do right? Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think of these things. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace, don't we all want peace, will be with you. Let us pray. Father, you've given us a day that we live in that really desperately wants peace, but they don't know what it is. And they don't know that it comes from you. And, and Father, but you put us here and let us be the voice and the trumpet that sounds out the call for where real peace is found. And it's found by living like you. Thinking like you and praying like you. And Father, Paul, and Father Paul has given us such a practical message here of how to do that in our life, even when it's very difficult. We can follow these words and apply them to any situation that we're in. So, Father, I'm glad that this passage of Scripture has become so powerful and common and quoted often in today's world because of this virus and because of the riots and, and political situation and many, many other things. Father, I'm glad it's become famous, but help us to remember that you really want us to do it. It doesn't matter to just read it and feel comforted. You want us to live this way. And we're going to need your help. We can't do that on our own. If we try, like Paul did, to live a life perfect for you, we will fail. That, all that stuff's of garbage, all the good that's in us. Father, we need to just follow you and trust you. And let you make us perfect. And, and we take on the righteousness of Christ. You give us that. Because of his death and his resurrection for us. So Father, as we leave today, help us to look at each other differently. As young fellows, as people that we dearly love. As people that we pray for. As people that we work side by side with and we want to spend eternity with. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen.